Well, I think we should just begin. And uh, we've only got an hour apparently. apparently. So um, the uh, the organization of this hour is first of all, Isabel's going to speak for about half an hour. Then uh, she and I are going, I'm going to respond to her paper uh, for about 15 minutes. And then I'm going to open it up to other questions or I've got enough questions um, for three hours. So. <laughs> So this is the first of a series potentially. So, um, but first of all, I'll give um, the introduction and then hand over to Isabel. Dr. Isabel Hess is senior lecturer in the English department at the University of Sydney and visiting fellow at the moment at the Parks Institute for May and June. So uh, till the end of this month. Her research is situated at the intersection of post-colonial Jewish and Middle Eastern studies. She is the author of The Politics of Jewishness in Contemporary World Literature, the Holocaust, Zionism and Colonialism, published by Bloomsbury in 2016, and co-editor of Literary Representations of the, Israel Pla of the Palestine Israel Conflict after the Second Intifada, uh, published by Edinburgh University Press this year. She is currently completing her second monograph, which examines the representation of Israel and Palestine in contemporary British and German culture. And it's from that monograph uh, that she's drawing uh, her presentation today. I think the research that's gone into that. So I was very excited to hear about Isabel and her work, which is why I really wanted to chair this session. And uh, having had a sneak preview of the paper, I know it's gonna be really provocative and productive of a really good discussion. So I'll hand over to you now, Isabel. Thank you, uh, thank you for your kind introduction. I hope you can all hear me. You might even see me. Oh. Here I am. Um, yes, please. Um, so thank you, Deborah, for the very kind introduction. Um, thank you to everyone who organized um, this event, um, including Anushka, George, and Claire. Thank you to Katie and, and Claire in the room for all the technical setup and um, also to the Parks Institute for hosting me. And also thank you everyone for joining um, at this very late stage of the term where I imagine everyone is incredibly busy. Um, so I launch into my presentation, which is entitled Disrupted Families Representing Jewish and Palestinian Histories in Contemporary British Culture. Um, and bear with me while I try to move the mouse <laughs> from the distance. Okay, let me, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to start with two epigraphs. The first one is by Jill Hodgeberg, who argues that Jew and Arab, rather than representing two independent identities, are in fact inevitably attached each necessarily configure true or in relation to the other. Bashi Bashi and Elia Pahur say that the Arab and Jewish questions continue to inform, feed, and kindle conflicts in Europe, the Middle East, and the United States. So these two ep epigraphs emphasize two key aspects of relationality that are at the heart of my current book and also my paper today. Jill Hodgeberg draws attention to how Jew and Arab are not separate identities, but shaped to their relations with each other, while Bashir Bashir and Nela Farouk emphasize the ways in which Israel and Palestine and relations between them are connected to and reflected in countries beyond Israel and Palestine. These ideas are also at the heart of my book uh, called Reimagining Israel and Palestine in Contemporary British and German Culture, which I'm currently completing. And this book proposes a relational approach to Israeli and Palestinian histories as depicted in works from outside the region. Um, and it addresses a significant turn in representing Israel and Palestine in British and German culture since the first Palestinian Intifada. This turn manifests itself on two levels. First of all, by depicting Israeli and Palestinian histories as relational rather than separate. And two, by representing the links between the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and its historical and political roots in Europe including the role that Germany and United Kingdom have played in the region. I'm happy to talk more about the book and its different case studies um, in the Q&A session, but for now, I want to discuss one of my case studies, which focuses on how family is used as a trope in two British works to engage with the competing histories of Israel and Palestine. And this is also one of the chapters of my book. So first of all, I just wanna talk a bit about kinships, families, and nations to give you the kind of background um, that I'm using in this chapter. So on an individual level, family, the family has often been seen as a bulwark against change and as a means to represent a unified position to the outside. It also serves to reify existing hierarchies and divisions, which has played a particularly important role in nationalism and the creation of nation states. Um, and McClintock reminds us nations are frequently figured to the iconography of familial and domestic space, and hence they become domestic genealogies. Let me just move this because I think people in the room can't see. Ooh, what have I done? Oh no. Sorry. Okay. 
Sorry, we're just having a quick technical issue, but otherwise I think people can't see the, the slides. All right, um, so let me return to Anne McClintock, um, who reminds us that nations are frequently figured to the iconography of familial and domestic space, and hence they become domestic genealogies. So the family plays an important role in delineating insiders and outsiders, including in contexts marked by nationalism um, and occupation. So similar ideas emerge when discussing the use of kinship um, in international relations. Ronnie Hjort, for example, has noted that the idea of the family of nations is exclusionary to its emphasis, and I quote, on familiarity among the political communities that count as equals, and indicating something that is not shared by all communities. This is particularly salient in the case of Palestine, which is usually not included in these discussions as it's not recognized as a nation state. Moreover, as Morton Scums with Anderson and Benjamin de Cavallo emphasize, and I quote, using kinship metaphors drawing on ideas of paternalism and tutelage, imperial and colonial uh, powers could hide the larger power differentials um, from view and legitimate such power differentials and associated coercive measures. Um, so this is to give you some kind of um, theoretical ideas before we move into the British works um, that I want to discuss in this paper, um, which are, this is not working, I think. So I'm just trying to move on the slide. It just has a picture. I don't think it's essential um, if we don't. Yes. Um, so this is Claire Hajat's um, novel, Ishmael's Oranges, published in 2014, and Hugo Blick's TV drama, The Honorable Woman, um, which came out in the same year. So both of these works consider how families and the ideologies that they transmit contribute to the exclusion of the other, and those that are seen as outside the collective national ethnic community, particularly Palestinians and their narratives of suffering and the replacement and dispossession at the hands of Israel, which in turn allows both artists to question the absence of Palestine from the family of nations. By focusing on disrupted families, including disrupted relations between parents and children, but also across divides, and thus disrupting traditional models of kinship based on shared ethnicity, Hajjaj and Blick challenge how ideas of kinship are used in relation to depicting the political relations between Israel and Palestine, but also between Israel, Palestine, and the wider world, including how being part of the family of nations is used to justify Israel's treatment of the Palestinians and to obscure Israel's role as an occupation power. So part one, Jewish-Palestinian relations in Claire Hajjaj Ishmael's Oranges. Um, the novel was inspired by Hajjaj's own experience of growing up with a Jewish mother and a Palestinian father. And she herself has said that Jewish and Palestinian narratives are, and I quote, in many ways, incredibly similar. In order to address the similarities between these narratives in her novel, Hajjaj uses the idea of kinship, specifically the libidinal and later conjugal relationship between a British woman called Jude and a Palestinian Salim. And the fact that they have two children together um, and she does this in order to situate Jewish and Palestinian histories in a comparative um, context. Um, so Hajjah's novel follows a trend that Ilan Pape has identified in Israeli cinema since the late 1980s. He observes that, and I quote, typical of this period were films modeled on the Romeo and Juliet type plot in which a Jewish woman falls in love with a Palestinian man against the wishes of their respective families and societies. Um, the first part of Ishmael's Oranges um, sets up this um, romance across the divide um, paradigm, and it's entitled Journeys and set in 1948. It opens with Salim's story, which is set in Jaffa during the final days of the British mandate. Salim and his family leave Jaffa as a result of the increasing violence perpetrated on Palestinians um, and the advancement of the Egun, the paramilitary Zionist organization on Jaffa, thus introducing the key themes of displacement and dispossession that recur throughout the novel. Salim's story of his and his family's dispossession and displacement in 1948 is followed by Jude's story, which is set in Sunderland in Northern England in 1956. Salim's and Jude's stories are initially not connected apart from the fact that June is born on the same day that the State of Israel was established. Hajjaj does not posit Jude as an allegory for Israel in her novel, um, as not much is made of this parallel, which mainly seems to serve the narrative purpose of establishing a link between Jude and Israel, which throughout her life is rather tenuous and thus with Salim and his fate, as Jude's birth is, 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 is implicitly linked to the suffering that Salim's family experiences as part of the establishment of the State of Israel. But Jude's childhood is marked by displacement and persecution as well, to the story of her grandmother, who has had to leave Russia at the turn of the 20th century because of the pogroms, and to Jude's adopted sister Gertie, who arrived on the Kindertransport, and is a haunting presence of the Holocaust throughout the novel. Jude herself also experiences anti-Semitism as part of a cruel incident um, where she's invited to another girl's birthday party, only to find a sign saying um, no Jews allowed at the entrance to the porch. 
Well, Hajat does not set up any direct parallels between the discrimination that Jude experiences and Salim's displacement. By moving back and forth between their narratives, she does encourage the reader to think about these experiences as similar and connected. Um, and in spite of Salim's strong attachment to the past and the loss of their house during the Nakba, so the Palestinian displacement and dispossession during the establishment of Israel, um, which is discussed throughout the novel, initially there does not seem to be a competition between Jewish and Palestinian memories um, when Jude um, and Salim are discussing this. Um, so one quote in the novel says, um, Jude told Salim about the grandmother who fled, fled the Russians, and he had talked about the siege of Nazareth and the Jewish commander who refused to sack the city. They'd agreed that religion didn't matter, that they had a lot in common and some nonsense about peace that reminded Salim of the flower songs. So for Jude and Salim, the conflict is linked to religion, which aligns with the idea of an age-old antagonism between Jews and Arabs due to religious differences, which is how the conflict is commonly represented in the media as well. However, this view conveniently occludes that the situation in Palestine and Israel is not driven by an age-old religious opposition um, as much as it's driven by um, Palestinians living under occupation and being dispossessed and displaced, which the novel draws our attention to. Um, um, so it soon emerges that for other people, their ethnicities are a problem though. So when Salim tells his brother Hassan about their relationship, emphasizing that, and I quote, Jude's not a Zionist, she understands us, she understands me, Hassan responds by saying that, and I quote, no matter what you think, they can't understand an Arab. It's not in their nature. While Salim makes an important distinction between Zionist and non-Zionist Jews, for Hassan, all Jews have unbridgeable differences with Palestinians. In this, indeed, this view is prominent on both sides since not differentiating between individuals and groups also emerges in Jude's family. When Jude tells her uncle Tony that she's dating a Palestinian, his reaction is similar to Salim's brothers. As Tony emphasizes that, and I quote, He'll never forgive you. Again, the statement does not consider people as individuals, but as representatives of their group. And this stance posits them as being unable to move beyond the division that is set up between Jewish and Palestinian people due to the histories of the Holocaust and the Nakba, which are seen as exclusionary narratives. So while Jude and Salim are mostly, mostly able to avoid this view in their relationship, the pressures from outside continue to grow. However, Jude comments that, and I quote, the birth of their perfect twins had reconciled doubters on both sides. Mark and Sophie had been a wondrous, glorious affirmation of their courage. The children are supposed to embody the ideal of a balanced Jewish-Palestinian identity, one that is not torn between the two sides, but that is able to reconcile the heritage and history of both parents. However, as they move to Kuwait, this becomes increasingly difficult, not least because of Salim's frustrations with not being promoted at work, which he blames on the Jewish people, telling Jude that, and I quote, you know, if it wasn't for your people, for the Jews, I would already be somebody. So his personal failure becomes tied up with the collective failure of the Palestinian people to reclaim, reclaim their land and to get closer to the goal of self-determination. When Hassan Mark says that he wants to go back to England, Salim tells him that Kuwait is their home and that he is, and I quote, an Arab too, you belong here, not there. Making sure that his children are Palestinian and remember their history becomes Salim's obsession, both in order to make up for his professional failure and for his personal inability to reclaim the person he would have become if it had not been for the Nakba. Mark's desire to move back to England is thus doubly vexing for Salim, as it not only removes him from the Middle East and a sense of Arabness um, that Salim hopes Kuwait can instill in him, but it also situates him closer to his mother's identity as a British Jewish woman through his decision to move back to the West. To Mark, Hudges emphasizes how divisive the conflict is on a personal level, which, is also, which also translates to the collective level when Mark talks about the two tribes, hers and his. Um, as Hatters has explained in an interview, belonging to a tribe gives you all sorts of certainties. It gives you a pre-inherited set of qualities. Who is my friend? Who is my enemy? What kind of life shall I live? And which values shall I hold? This sets up a key tension between ethnicities or tribes in the novel, reflecting the idea of a clash of civilizations as an unbridgeable gap. This reference to tribalism can also be linked to the significant role that family is seen as playing in corroborating wider ideas related to exclusion against the separatist imaginary that draws on a past that emphasizes differences rather than connections. In a novel, Hajas, as she has explained in an interview, and I quote, wanted to answer the question, what happens when a Jew or a Palestinian chooses to take a different course to shape a life that doesn't conform to the traditions of those tribes? However, it becomes increasingly apparent, especially in light of political events, such as the 1982 massacre in the Sabra and Shatia refugee camps, that it's impossible for Jude and Salim to separate their individual identities from their collective histories and hence to combine their Jewish and Palestinian heritage. This also manifests itself once again to their son Mark, who tells his father that, and I quote, I don't want to be a Palestinian or a Jew. Sophie and me, we're not like that. We don't want to get involved in all that fighting. 
You never ask us what we want, who we want to be. So when Salim does ask Mark what he wants to be, he responds, a dancer, emphasizing that he wants to define himself outside of prescribed categories that are usually seen as oppositional, pa Palestinian and Jew. And Jude and Salim similarly confirm that it's impossible to combine these categories as eventually their relationship, eventually their relationship fails, which aligns with the tragic endings that Anna Bernard has identified in the genre of the partition romance, where, I quote, unification is unrealizable in the present, and the desired union of the lovers often has the effect of intensifying the divide rather than undermining it, end quote. So to the very act of failing, Jude and Salim's relationship challenges the idea that relationships between Jewish and Palestinian people, as Ilan Pape has suggested, are, and I quote, a way to avoid and evade rational recognition of the arguments and feelings of the other side. Instead of the character of Salim and his inability to move on, Hajat's novel makes it clear how the suffering inflicted on the Palestinians during the Nakba continues to impact their lives into the present and draws attention to the ways in which competing narratives shape both Jewish and Palestinian people. A focus on the ways in which the competition between Jewish and Palestinian narratives disrupts one specific family can also be read as a model for reconsidering how Jewish and Palestinian narratives of suffering and displacement are represented in the UK more widely. This model emphasizes not only the benefits of situating Jewish and Palestinian narratives alongside each other and drawing attention to their connections, but also the ways in which a critical dialogue between them allows us to identify hidden power relations, such as the relative silence surrounding the British mandate in Palestine, in British culture and politics, and the impact that this has had on contemporary Israel and Palestine. So now moving on to Hugo Blick's um, The Honorable Woman, um, and this section is entitled Family Conflict and Identity. So an emphasis on putting Jewish and Palestinian narratives into a critical dialogue also shapes British director Hugo Blick's TV drama, The Honorable Woman, an eight-part miniseries produced for and shown on the BBC and Sundance TV, which follows Anglo-Jewish businesswoman Nessa Stein, um, played by Maggie Gyllenhaal, and you can see her um, on this cover of the DVD. So Blick has explained in an interview that in his TV drama, and I quote, it was very interesting to take a world issue, distill it into a single family, and then explore how this tested them. So Blick consciously uses the situation in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories as a trope, uh, emphasizing that it functions as a creative device and one, and I quote, that viewers can relate to or are aware of. However, he also uses different relationships, including that between children and parents and Jewish and Palestinian people to make the conflict more accessible to his audiences, as well as to challenge the separation between Jewish and Palestinian narratives and history in British culture. Um, and the tension between affiliation, um, oh no, sorry, this is the wrong page. Here we go. So what becomes clear um, is that Brit, uh, Blick's protagonist, Nasa, does not fit the typical mode of individuals who seek refuge in their families at times of conflict, which as Sarah Harwood argues is done in order to, and I quote, search for absolute, absolute values, unassailable moral positions, which are apparently outside ideology and outside history. Instead, family conflict is at the heart of the series as Nasser consciously distances herself from her father, Eli Stein, who supported Israel's military efforts by producing rifles, mortar shells, and tanks, and sold them to Israel. Nasser, on the other hand, insists on helping Israel in a different way, as she tells the audience that, and I quote, we believe that the strongest wall that we can help Israel to maintain is the one to which equality of opportunity can pass. Um, in spite of this quite heavy-handed metaphor, her company strives to achieve this by laying cables for internet and telephone, supporting telecommunication in the West Bank. So while the relationship with her family, including with her father and her brother, serve as a foil to highlight the ways in which NASA runs the company differently and adopts a more critical stance vis-a-vis -vis events in the Middle East, the relationship between NASA and the main Palestinian character Attica, uh, played by Ubna, Lubna Azabal, who is NASA's translator and confidant, and later the nanny um, and lover of her brother Afra, is used to provide an alternative sense of belonging, at least from NASA's perspective. This sets up a productive tension between filiation and affiliation, um, which Edward Said um, has famously um, defined on one hand, affiliation as the culture to which one is bound by birth, nationality, or profession, and affiliation as the system acquired by social and political conviction and economic or historical um, circumstances. So this tension between filiation and affiliation uh, contributes to challenging the family as representative for tribalism and clear-cut ethnic distinction, um, it distinctions and the ways in which the family is usually seen as the repository of ideology, especially in terms of conflict. Moreover, Nessa's and Attica's relationship is used to challenge ideas about common perceptions of Israel as a victim and the absence of a Palestinian narrative in international politics by introducing the audience to Palestinian histories of suffering and Palestinian aspirations to self-determination through Attica's perspective. 
Um, and just a brief disclaimer in um, the next few paragraphs, there's going to be mention of rape and sexual assault, just um, so that people are aware of this. Um, so a key event in Nasa's life and one that is at the heart of her personal conflict, but also one that cemented her friendship with Attica is when she and Attica are kidnapped in the Gaza Strip when Nasa goes there to resolve an issue related to corruption um, within the foundation set up by her family. So through a series of flashbacks, the audience slowly finds out that while held captive, Nasa was raped by her ki kidnapper, which adds to the audience's understanding of Nasa's character in the present, including the fact that she sleeps in a panic room every night. So when Nasa and Attica get attacked during their captivity, the attacker at threatens to kill Attica, but Nasa offers, a, offers to have sex with him so that he spares Attica, making her the honorable woman of the title of the series. If we read Nasa's rape in light of colonial ideas of the woman as land, we, in, we can interpret the sexual assault as symbolic, but of course very problematic, um, reclaiming of the lost land, but one that is done by the oppressed rather than the oppressor. Nevertheless, similar to colonial fantasies about women, we can read this moment as what Anne McClintock has called, and I quote, a compensatory gesture making up for a loss of power. Um, and this loss of power can, of course, be seen more widely um, in Palestinian society, including to their lack of political leadership, especially since the Oslo Accord in 1993. Um, Blake doesn't really talk about this, but it's uh, kind of obvious in the series that this is what he's alluding to. Um, ten weeks later, while they're still in captivity, Nessa finds out that, he, that she's pregnant, but she's unable to get an abortion, since, as Attica tells her in the series, under Sharia law, all life is sacred. After the birth of her son, Kasim, Nessa and Attica are able to leave with Kasim, and it's agreed that Attica will look after him as her own. While the rape seemed to be a, rape seemed to be a decision in the moment, later on, Zaid al Zaid, the rapist's father and Kasim's grandfather, makes clear that he ordered his son to rape Nessa. Um, and he says um, in the series that, quote, First, I ordered Eli Stein's death, um, and now I take his heritage. So he was also involved in killing um, the father, which I didn't have time to talk about in this paper. So this situates this rape within a wider framework of using rape as a weapon of war, as the child, which is of mixed Jewish Palestinian heritage, is seen as a way to dilute the Jewishness of the Stein family, or to use Anne McClintock's words when talking about rape in the context of war, and I quote, as a brutally enforced hybridity, even though, of course, in light of matrilineal heritage, Kasim's identity would still be considered Jewish. However, Kasim's hybridity is hidden as he grows up as part of Nasser's brother's household, and his mixed heritage is not addressed because people are not aware of this. Nevertheless, he becomes one of the key catalysts in the series for the audience to uncover Nasser's backstory and to untangle Jewish-Palestinian relations, especially those between Nasser and Attica. At the end of the first episode, Kasim is kidnapped um, at the ceremony where Nasser will be made Baroness um, Stein of Tilbury. Um, and finding Kasim is one of the key driving um, forces of the series, and this culminates um, also in the final episode, where we find out, or we find out a bit more about Nessa's and Attica's identities and their relationship with each other. Um, so in this final episode, or in the one just before, Nessa is kidnapped again after a bomb was set off at an event that she held in Hebron for her company's phase three broadband rollout. During their renewed captivity, Attica confesses that she knew that they would kidnap Nessa um, when they went to the Gaza Strip the first time, so nine years ago, um, but that she didn't know what that man would do to her and that she tried to stop him. So when Nessa asks Attica why, Attica explains that when she was 12, she lost all of her family and she then shows Nessa a piece of shrapnel from a bomb that has the name Stein on it, indicating that her family was killed by a weapon manufactured by Nessa's father and thus drawing attention to the relationships between their families, including the invisible relations between actions in the West, such as providing weapons to Israel and the death of Palestinians. Nasser explains that she tried to help, but Attica emphasizes that the Palestinians need a nation and that, and I quote, what Nasser tried doesn't change anything for her people, they need so much more. While Nasser's efforts to improve communication are admirable but naive, they do not translate into any specific progress in terms of Palestinian liberation and self-determination. Um, Blick does envision a short-lived um, solution to the conflict, which I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A, um, but I'm just going to move um, to the rest of the paper because it's more focused on the family. So after a disagreement she has with Zaid or Zaid, Attica stabs him when he attacks her with a knife, saying that vengeance is not our goal. This casts her in the role of the honorable woman of the title, which is confirmed when she later sacrifices herself so that Nasa and Kasim can escape. The series ends with Nasa and Kasim visiting Nasa's brother's wife, Rachel, who has just given birth in hospital, with Kasim easily fitting into the Stein family in spite of his hybridity, while Nasa stands apart, which suggests that due to her trauma, she will be unable to fully belong anywhere. 
Um, and Blick has described Nessa as a woman who is deeply conflicted about past events, events that have haunted her, and he emphasizes that um, this, and I quote, is the reason why she's constantly battling a consuming internal conflict, this internal struggle for reconciliation with her past and a search for personal equilibrium, and that this is also evident in her political activities and her attempts to reconcile a conflict that has equally haunted a region of the world, countless lives and political agendas for many years. So the disrupted family becomes an apt metaphor for depicting um, not only the internal uh, conflict that NASA is experiencing, but also the relations between Jewish and Palestinian people and their respective experiences of conflict. And it, oh, and it certainly um, makes sense, um, makes these more relatable to Blick's audiences. However, a focus on disrupted families also once again challenges ideas of belonging and alliances based on ethnicity and exposes the family as what Sarah Harwood has described it as a quote, and I quote, a convenient vehicle for celebrating or denigrating sociocultural organization and for hiding such oppressed groups um, within. Um, and then just to conclude, as Anne McClintock has argued um, in the introduction to this paper, nations are often represented to ideas linked to the family. But as Clintock goes on to argue, one of the dangers of this approach is that the family, and I quote, becomes indispensable for legitimizing exclusion and hierarchy within non-familial so social formations such as nationalism, liberal individualism, and imperialism. What we see in the two cultural works discussed today is the deliberate refusal to legitimate exclusion to the use of the family, and instead both Hajat and Blick disrupt the family as a model for the nation, especially for a nation or national community defined by ethnicity. Both artists use alternative alliances, including libidinal and amicable relations across divides and the presence of Jewish Palestinian children to bring together Jewish and Palestinian narratives and to uncover the at times hidden relations between them. To the emphasis on rationality and an alternative approach to kinship, both artists encourage their audiences to reflect on the power differentials that govern these contexts, including those between Israel, Palestine and the UK, but also between Israel, Palestine and international powers, which are often occluded in discussions that emphasize the kinship approach on a national and international level. Thank you very much. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you, can you hear me? Okay, so thank you so much, Isabel, for that. Um, I mean, there is so much in that paper. So, um, and I don't think we can, well, I don't think we're going to get to cover nearly half of it, or or, or even a fraction, a fraction of it. I suppose what I wanted to um, really hone in on on my part of the questioning, because it's just been so generative for me thinking about this, and I'm aware that generative is another metaphor that fits in with the metaphor of the of the family, is 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 to really think through uh, um, this tool that you're looking at of of you know what role does the metaphor of the family have in uh, a political context uh, and when thinking about political struggles, national struggles, um, and uh, particularly in the context of Palestine and Israel and the way the family has a particular resonance uh, there. Um, uh, but I was really, I was really interested in how you ended uh, your presentation there because you ended, I think, returning to McClintock by saying that that it's very important to disrupt this metaphor of the family, uh, particularly as a model for the nation state that is particularly eth the ethnic uh, nation state, uh, and that these works that you're looking at move towards other kinds of uh, libidinal or conjugal relationships uh, that lead us out of that sort of ethnic binding. But of course, a conjugal relationship is setting up a new family. I mean, we're not, we can't escape the family very easily. Uh, so so uh, I'm, I suppose one of the things I sort of want to begin by thinking about and putting to you is what is a family? I mean, do we have a working definition of a family? And there's a related series of questions, so maybe you can think this through, because you say that your approach is relational and you think that these cultural works are kind of turning towards the relational. Uh, I suppose, as opposed to what? So what is the working model for thinking through uh, these histories and these political sort of situations. Uh, what, 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 how, how are they thought through without the concept of relationality? And, um, and whilst there's certainly a case to be made, and I think you've made it very well, that, that the family blurs the way, can blur, familiarity can blur the way power really works and abuses can thrive in that context in a way that they might not be easily witnessed, uh, in, in a way that they're not easily witnessed. You're also, I think, suggesting that actually, if we think about families, 
new things can get exposed that if we don't think about families. So actually the family makes certain things possible as well as certain things, it was all good and bad things possible perhaps. So I, I, I wondered if you could just begin with sort of what is a family, what is non-relationality when one's thinking about these things? Yes, um, thank you so much. Those are really um, great questions. Um, so I'll start with the family, um, and I should probably have to find that um, from the start. So um, in national, usually the model is the heteronormative um, family. So you have um, a man and a woman and possibly a few children. Um, so there's a sense of like the family unit. It could also be family that lives together in the same um, household. So this sense of like um, a family that would also, in terms of the children, we be we would have like a patchwork family. So we would have like a quite traditional um, children are the children of the two parents that are living with them. Um, so I think quite a heteronormative approach to the family. Um, but I think it's a really good question. So um, it would be really interesting. Um, and if anyone knows of any works that do not use that model, um, I would love to hear about them in terms of approaching um, the family as a metaphor in the context of Israel and Palestine, because I, I was really thinking about this. It would be intriguing to see a model that is not um, based on this uh, man, woman, and one or two children, um, and what that would do in terms of thinking about a nation. Um, in, our, in terms of your second question, this idea of relationality, I think, is mainly defined in a position to um, separating the two histories. So representing them as completely disconnected, um, as occluding similarities. Um, I think partly it comes from um, theories around, um, I think especially in a German context, considering the Holocaust as unique. Um, and the Holocaust not being able to be compared to anything. Um, I'm not sure to what extent the Michael Rothberg controversy made it into the UK news. Um, but his work was translated, I think, in 2020 or 2021 into German, and that created a massive controversy in Germany um, because people were just saying you cannot look at the Holocaust in a comparative fashion. Um, and in the German context, it was in relation to colonialism and um, German colonialism. Um, so I'm thinking relational in terms of thinking about how, um, and this is, I think, the chapter that takes this most literally, where you have the family relation as a relation. Um, but I'm also thinking just more generally about how the histories of um, Israel and Palestine are considered alongside each other. How do works represent them um, as being connected, but also thinking about how Germany and the UK play a role in um, these histories. So relation also relates to how um, Israel and Palestine is often seen as something that's completely separate from what's happening in German and British politics, when in fact there's a lot of um, events that have shaped and continue to shape the way in which um, events play out in the Middle East. Um, yeah, and I liked your point about the family as exposing good and bad things. So I think one of the interesting things um, to think about is how, I think especially Haja thinks about the possibilities that it could open up the family as like a mixed Jewish-Palestinian model. Um, but I think just based on her own, and this is based on her own experience um, because her parents got divorced as well. Um, so the sense of how it also creates these separations because it's, she, as she represents, it's impossible to merge those two histories, especially in um, the identity of the children. Um, so in the novel, Mark, um, and again, I didn't have time to talk about this, um, throws a Molotov cocktail into the house that used to be his father's house and his family's house, and he dies in the process. So there's also this sense of like, he cannot really exist as someone um, who cannot reconcile these two parts of his identity. I mean, that's very, I mean, I, I felt very strongly in your presentation. I didn't know the entire background of a judge, but the, 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 I felt very strongly in your presentation, the sort of plight of the child who has no say in this is sort of born, born I mean, and, and who has these two sort of possibilities over their identity, that one of them is, I am love, you know, I am not my, the very, my existence is a proof of love above, <laughs> above everything else, because people have crossed lines it's i'm i'm the i must be a love child by very definition unless of course i'm a child of coercion and, and, and rape which you also went into but in the first case the idea is we can transcend our histories and come together and love and therefore i am love uh, and the other and the other one is that i am born sort of bifurcated and 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 and, and, and i am war <laughs> so, so, so i mean the, and the, the child who has no choice is sort of you know uh, the, the question of their identity must be um uh you know very very um potent throughout throughout their life and decisions seem to always be made i'm not enjoying the bit where i look at myself <laughs> um I, I don't know i preferred looking at, at isabel <laughs> but if that's an option 
No, I can't look at Isabel. Maybe if I I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you, Isabel, but I'm I appear to be <laughs> asking myself questions. <laughs> so um 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 uh but I, I like what you were saying there that some some somehow a family uh when when we when we bring the family in into into our accounts then we can do things that we that we might not do without thinking in familial terms so we can start comparing histories um uh we can start thinking about uh histories as comparative and competitive and um and and so we can start sort of tearing apart ideas of autonomy uh, in various ways, and I think that becomes a theme increasingly throughout uh, your book, where the aspiration is for self-determination, but I think a family, uh, the aspiration is for self-determination, both uh, in Israel and Palestine, that's, those are buzzwords, right, and for nation states in general, but I think a family uh, makes self-determination a very troubled concept, just as a goal uh, uh, or, or a possibility. Um, I suppose in the psychoanalytic context, you know, a family is um, is uh, well. One definition is that it's it's where more than one generation lives together um, and has a passion for living together and has an actual. They want to live together. I mean, that would be sort of constitutive of a kind of idea of of the family. And it's a place where you raise children and you regulate sexuality uh, and and so on. So so the moment somebody doesn't want to be of the family or to live with the family, then the family itself is a subject for critique and people start um, thinking about it. But then the, the question becomes, what are the other what are the other models? Are there better models uh, for people living together? What are the other models? Because the other thing, a family makes us aware of is that we have to bear our frustrations. And we have to, um, we can't always have what we want. Families show you this. <laughs> so we have to negotiate and compromise. So what are the other models that, that if, if this isn't a great one, if you see what I mean? Mm, that's a really great question. Um, yes, I'm trying to think, because I think what really struck me in um, The Honorable Woman is how Blick plays with this idea with the brother who's in like the typical family model um, with the wife, they have two children, they have another child on the way. And I think he uses that quite strongly to contrast with Nessa as the single woman. Um, well, I think until the second to last episode, we're not aware that Kasim is her child. Um, so I think there's also this clear playing these stereotypical models against each other. Um, yeah, in terms of other models, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has any insights into that. Um, I think you could think about non-familiar models in terms of people living together based on a shared understanding. You could think about friendships, um, which again, Blick does to a certain extent, but he really just drops it by the end because even though Nessa thinks um, she and Attica, they have this great friendship, we find out that Attica was using her all along and that she's more like a tool for her to I don't think revenge is her goal, but um, to a certain extent to further her goals in terms of liberation and self-determination. Um, so I think even a model of the friendship doesn't quite hold up. I think the model that Hajash endorses is between the twins. So the sense of like, they're like almost their own little bubble of the siblings. Um, but again, she disrupts that when Mark dies in the end and then Sophie is left as the only twins I think also playing on this idea while well, not playing this very real sense of twins almost being part of the same person that is then disrupted by one of them being taken away so but I think that's a really good question what are the other models that are being brought into play to think about the idea of Israel and Palestine so thank you I, I mean I suppose one of the things that I was thinking of as you were particularly as you were reading the paper just now is that I I I mean, there is a kind of way in which you can think of the family as that metaphor is very often critical to, 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 to people in, in a state of struggle who feel, so, 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 I mean, you can call each other comrades, but you can call each other sister and you can call each other brother, whether or not your blood, your blood relations, that sort of family metaphor, um, a, a kind of um, sort of insisted upon intimacy and relationality I think is very often part of the sort of language of, of revolutionary struggle very often um, as if the goal would be as if the goal would be to get to a, a place a place of politics but you're not there yet or a kind of purity of politics but but you're not you're not there yet I'm not I, I, I suppose I'm wondering if one I don't feel 
that one can dispense with this metaphor very easily <laughs> at all. Um, uh, and, and, um, and I think one of the things your paper brings out is, is we can't divorce ourselves from, from the family on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, when we're looking at po a political situation like this, as Ilan Pape says, it's Romeo and Juliet. People can fall in love, but they can't marry. Mar and marriage can't work because that's the social contract and power and, and, and who has power will come into the fore. So um, um, I don't know if you see it like that, that you see as the family as a sort of en route to the political or do you, I, I can't see you again now. I seem to be looking at a very nice Maybe man. Both. But I don't, know, I don't know who the man I'm looking at is, but he seems <laughs> to be. <laughs> um, I'll try to get the owl to move in my direction. She might, might not see that. It's not that much to ask somebody who's caught in the lens. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to try to. I'll try. I'll try if it reacts. Yes. <laughs> okay, will it come back? This is a bit like getting a dog to touch a stick. Okay, yes, I think we got it, kind of. Um, so you were asking about, um, can we dispense with the family as a metaphor? Sorry, I'm just- well, I suppose I, I'm, I'm really, you were drawing out passages where, and that was it, because you were looking at the sort of Romeo and Juliet paradigm. This is uh, the, the, the Romeo, oh wait, you've gone again. So the Romeo and Juliet paradigm where, where um, uh, that you know, Romeo and Juliet are our ultimate romantic lovers. They're our ultimate idea of romance, precisely because their love has no kind of social sanction. So it's sort of completely its own thing, and it can't work in reality because marriage brings in the social and it brings in power, and we see where powers play. And mm. and, and and so the the idea, I mean, and this is the idea that that one's working with that actually love is a beautiful language, but it doesn't solve this conflict conflict uh, uh, because actually it's you know, we have to look at power and, and, and property and, and, and rights and, and so on. Um, but there are, you know, there are confusions here. And so you were drawing attention to, um, I think Salim uh, at some point says, you know, at the beginning of their relationship, he says, she understands us and mm. somebody else is saying, no, no, she never will. But as their relationship fractures, um, he, he starts blaming, um, and you know, it's very often married couples, one of them feels frustrated with their lot and they blame their spouse. You're stopping me be, <coughs> be. But it's much bigger if you say, you and all your people are stopping me be who I want to be. Um, it's a much bigger problem that you've got within the home. Like it's a global geopolitical problem that you brought into your home somehow. And, and cu couples go through this a lot. Couples who, are, who cross lines do find that at some, po some point they bring in kind of world histories to their living room and stuff and of course you never know is it because of that conflict that he didn't get his job or mm. is it or, or or is it something else and so just in the same way that the personal can often veil the political which is I think what you're mostly drawing attention to here it's also true we know that the political can veil the personal and 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 so and and that can happen as well and particularly in intimate relationships and, and it's very tragic so I just suppose I I'm not um I think you're you're drawing attention to the ways in which the family is a real problem for politics, but it's not one that I think uh, um, uh, we know how to we know how to escape. Mm. I suppose um, I, that that was just I suppose one point I wanted to say. I know that we have to uh, go to the um, audience for the, this bit, but I just wanted to ask you as well about basically this sort of German culture and British culture that is mm. the sort of is where your inquiry lands, because that seems to me also to be to do with, you know, who are the parents of this conflict in various ways and, mm. and, and sort of, can, can we talk about why why that, that's where you're pointing your analysis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, and my apologies, I didn't have a lot of time to set the groundwork. Um, so I picked Germany and UK as the two main countries to focus on, even though there were definitely plenty others, France and US come to mind, and there's probably a series of other places. Um, because both countries, um, first of all, have an interesting history in terms of World War II and the Holocaust and the way the Holocaust is remembered. Um, and then both of them also have a really interesting history in terms of colonialism. Um, so the British, of course, um, as the mandatory power in Palestine. Um, but Germany also had this interesting relationship with Israel as a proxy colony. So the sense of like, because they had quite a short lived experience of being a colonizing power. Um, the treaty establishment of Israel, there was a sense of like, this is part of almost their own colonization. And it's fulfills the, the hopes that they couldn't quite fulfill. 
Um, and the other really interesting thing in both countries is that um, in terms of politics, there's been a really ambiguous relationship with both Palestine and Israel. So both countries moving back and forth between being pro-Palestine, being pro-Israel, um, which you can see especially on the left. Um, and then of course, East Germany, West Germany, um, which is why I used those two countries because I thought they had really interesting approaches. Um, and just like in terms of overall findings, they're also really interesting in terms of how, um, to what extent a lot of the German works are quite conservative in terms of how they approach um, the representation of Palestine um, because of the history of the Holocaust and just to link it back to the Michael Rothberg example, which just shows you um, to what extent there's a rejection of comparative work in that sense um, in relation to the Holocaust. Um, yeah, I think those are the main. Thank you. Yeah, it's so interesting. And uh, but I, I've, I'm being called up on how it's hogging too much time. So I'm, I'm going to start asking some of these questions that have shown up on the chat uh, on behalf of the questioners. And then you can also ask in, in the room as well if there are questions. Uh, this is Rosalind. Uh, <coughs> just as there are fictional narratives from both Arab Palestinians and Jewish Palestinians, you've chosen fiction to denote the conflict. In Israel. Please explain why you've chosen fictional stories for the basis of your study and not real people with real stories. Thank you. Um, that's a really good question, Rosalind. Um, one of my other chapters does look at, um, or there's a documentary in there. And um, again, my apologies, I didn't have time to explain the product as a whole. Um, so there's a really interesting documentary, um, a German documentary, which looks, which is called The Heart of Janine. Um, and it looks at a famous story of um, a Palestinian boy who died um, and his organs were donated. And I think three out of five organs went to Jewish people. Um, so this is a really interesting documentary that talks about further about this idea of relationality and um, this idea of um, someone being part of someone else's body, this blood relations. Um, so that is um, a true story in terms of thinking about relations between um, Israeli and Palestinian people. Um, and I'm also looking at another documentary. Again, it's a German one. Um, which is called Balagan, and it follows the production of Arbeit macht frei from Todland, um, which you might know, which is um, about um, Holocaust memory in Israel. So it was 1992, I think, when it was produced. Um, and the documentary follows the mixed Israeli-Palestinian theater group that put on this show. Um, so it shows the excerpts on the play, but it also gives you the background of um, so post-first Palestinian intifada, the kind of tensions that Israel was grappling with different groups. So you have an um, Israeli Jewish person with um, a Holocaust survivor as parents. I think both parents are Holocaust survivors. You have an um, Israeli Arab Jew who draws on this, that kind of heritage, and you also have an Israeli Palestinian. So really drawing attention to um, the key groups that make up um, life in Israel and the kind of tensions that they experience, but also their relationships with the Holocaust, which is really interesting in the documentary. Thank you. Obviously, I fully approve of you looking at fiction too, as well as in the literature department, <laughs> just to let you know. So, um, um, uh, so this is a question from, well, this is a question from Arts and Humanities in Southampton, seemingly. I don't, I don't know if you have a person behind it. Um, I was interested in the Honourable Woman. If Blick wants to highlight Palestinian narratives and be critical of the occupation, uh, why does he choose for the oppressed figure to be the perpetrator of sexual assault, continuing the Israeli victim narrative? Oh, that's Anushka. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you, Anushka. That's a really interesting question. I've only recently started really um, thinking about this. So um, this specific scene, um, because I'm in the process of yeah, working through that chapter. Um, I thought it was really interesting in terms of the rhetoric that is usually um, used around rape and war. Um, and I couldn't, yeah, I haven't quite gotten my head around what he's trying to do. Um, so I think partly he's trying to use just this idea of the sexual assault as an explanation for Nessa's character. Um, but I think by specifically having um, someone who is clearly Palestinian um, perpetrate a rape and also being ordered to do it, so not the spur of the moment, like a conscious decision, um, I think it's making some yeah, problematic um, assumptions about, yeah, I think this idea of reclaiming power. Um, yeah, when I was reading out, I felt like saying this is not something I support in any way. I'm just trying to give you the theory behind it. Um, and it's not effective in any way either if you think about the series as a whole. Um, so I'm thinking he might just have thought about this. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if he probably thought it through. I still have to look into whether I can find any interviews in terms of explaining why he has chosen this. I think it's one of the things he has been most heavily criticized for um, in terms of people reviewing the series, just saying that this didn't quite work. Um, and of course, it, yeah, it doesn't quite work. So Yes, I think it was really interesting because when I just looked into some of the theories that you talk about rape as a weapon of war, it's usually 
um, the person um, not be oppressed with using that tool. So, yeah, I think in terms of what I was trying to say in my paper is the way I read it, it's mostly aimed at the sense of diluting um, heritage. So that's the way I read it. And it was also just in the series quite clearly linked to the sense of just getting back at um, NASA's father in any possible way. So it's also, I think, just like as a quite an obvious revenge, um, not fantasy, but actually, yeah, revenge. So, yeah, but really, yeah, a really interesting moment that I think I need to think about in more detail because I'm, yeah, I'm not 100% sure what Blake is trying to do on like a political metaphorical level. Um, yeah, thank you. There's a, another question from uh, Rosalind. How does Germany's guilt conscience feed into the speakers, uh, into, I think that's your observations, uh, as a member from a country of the family of warmongers between um, speech marks? I don't know if that's quoting. Okay. Um, um, so what, the disclaimer is I'm from Luxembourg, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I don't really need to talk about Germany's conscience from that point of view. Uh, I'm not sure if you'd like me to say anything. Okay. Else. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, yeah. So I, I yeah. I guess that was uh, an assumption <laughs> in that question. I, I suppose that I suppose that um, I suppose I suppose there is a question of um, since you're looking at Germany as well as uh, the UK of. I mean, I had not heard this before that you said just before that Germany saw Israel as a kind of colonial outpost. Yes. Um, or that one of its first colonial experiments. Or, I mean, th th this is, uh, I mean, another completely new vista onto the situation mm. um, for me. For me. Um, yeah, I'm not sure to what extent, how widely popular that um, idea is, um, but there's been some interesting um, research around it. I think, again, specifically to looking at travelogues um, and people traveling to uh, German writers going to um, Palestine and then Israel um, mm -hmm. and the kind of tropes that they use. So you often find the Arab as this backward um, Oriental person, um, whereas the Jewish people are represented as pioneers, as um, making the land, um, making the desert bloom. So those kind of tropes. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's a narrative that's widely circulated in Germany, but there's some interesting research coming out in terms mm -hmm. of um, some of the literary texts and the kind of approach that they've taken. It's such an interesting side effect of that. I mean, that, that you suddenly realize that that's going on too. And uh, yeah, yeah. It's, um, and it certainly would open up all kinds of ideas. Uh, are there any other questions either in the room or online that um, anybody wants to ask before? I'm happy to pass. Oh yeah, there's one, there's a human one. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a fast question. Thank you for the presentation, first of all. Uh, my question, why do you think the uncle said they will never forgive you? Based on what he, he made that assumption? Yes, uh, that's a really good question. Um, so I think there's this sense of, in certain circles, um, where there's the sense that the Holocaust was the catalyzing event that led to the establishment of Israel, that then led to the displacement and dispossession of the Palestinians. Um, so I think the, the uncle is kind of repeating those kind of ideas in terms of um, if you're Jewish, you're representative of a whole nation and you're representative of the trauma of the Palestinians. Um, and as the novel plays out, that's what we see that um, Salim is unable, or at least I think Deborah made a really interesting point in terms of thinking about how the political might be veiling the personal where Salim is using it almost as um, saying, oh, because of your people, I wasn't able to, um, to move up or I'm not living the life that I could. Um, so I think um, Hajash in interesting ways um, talks about this idea of one person being representative of the nation as well. So this sense of like, um, you're being blamed for whatever your nation is doing, which I think you find in many different contexts, but which can often be found um, in relation to Jewish people being blamed, for example, for Israel's action, actions. Any other questions in the room while I'm holding the microphone? As you were talking, I was just thinking, of, since you're doing fiction and sort of popular fiction in a way and film, I just wondered, it's a bit banal, but about the film Belfast by Kenneth Branagh, given that the religious controversy and setting the troubles and the boy, if I, as far as I remember the film, ending up regretting that he didn't have a relationship with his Catholic girl, even younger than Juliet. But, uh... Yes, um, thank you. A really great question. Um, so there's been some research on comparing um, 
what they call like the partition romance um, in Northern Ireland, um, in Israel, Palestine and India, Pakistan. So Joe Cleary has done a book on that. Um, I'm blanking the title, um, but it's a really interesting um, comparative context. Unfortunately, it's outside of my um, project, but I think especially um, the sense of like the religious conflict and again, the romance across the divide. Um, and there's yeah, other works, I think other books whose titles I'm blanking that also really think about this idea again, the, Romeo and Juliet, Juliet um, kind of plot type. So I think there's interesting parallels and I'm sure there's another book that someone could write where <laughs> they compare Northern Ireland with Germany and the UK, or maybe someone already has done that. Were there any follow-up questions there? Because I, I could follow up. <laughs> I'm conscious I'm talking too much, but um, are there any other, I don't wanna ask the next question if there's somebody else with a question. Anyone else in the there room? Isn't if there <laughs> isn't, I will ask a question. <laughs> um, because um, uh, I mean, I do think this was another aspect, and I'm glad that last question brought this out. That 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 the religious, because it was another thing you raised, the idea that in the same way that family occludes power, that religion occludes power, that when we speak about these conflicts uh, as religious conflicts, um, uh, and that's how they're largely seen, perhaps. Uh, that perhaps we're not sort of thinking about territory and land again and rights and, and power and so on. But once again, I think I think the move there to then say, well, it's not really about religion would be to miss a miss miss the fact that it also is. And 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 the fact that that if if actors on the ground are seeing themselves as, as involved in a religious conflict. Then, then we have to take religious seriously. And you began with the idea that this particular conflict between Palestine and Israel has, has sort of located itself all around the world where, there are, where it's sort of very determined and overdetermined by other people's involvement in it because it is in you know, the Holy Land. And, and, um, and so I, I wondered, um, I suppose I wondered what, you know what what way we can how how we if we find religion uh to be a sort of mask for power is there again i suppose it's the same question again how can we begin to talk meaningfully about power in such a way that we acknowledge that, that the people themselves think they're involved in a religious <laughs> in a religious conflict very, very often I, I i you can't answer that that's a ridiculous thing for me to have asked you. i should also never have asked you that i should never have asked you that <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking again, um, it's really interesting how religion is bound up with territory or specific, as you say, holy land, holy places. Um, but I was also immediately thinking of just religion as this um, unifying factor, this transnational concept. Um, and of course, Jerusalem as um, a holy site for so many different religions. And also the sense of like, it's not just about Israel and Palestine. If you think about religion, it then becomes often, um, of course, mistakenly, this conflict between the Jewish and the Muslim people. Um, although, of course, a lot of Palestinians are Christians. So I think, again, it tends to occlude a lot of the power differentials and a lot of the um, intricacies of the conflict again. But I think often you get the sense of like, especially this idea of an age old religious conflict that on one hand um, mobilizes so many people to take a side, um, but on the other hand also occludes a lot of the things that, been ha that have been happening more recently. Um, and I think also in interesting ways, doesn't really address the history of um, coexistence before the establishment of Israel. So the sense of Jewish and Palestinian people living um, in Palestine, um, side by side, um, without any problems because they had different religions. Of course, there were um, more and more problems as the British arrived, but the sense of like not really addressing it, there was a history of coexistence um, where people were, at least for that period of time, um, happy to live alongside each other and didn't have any problems with their neighbors having a different religion. That's quite a nice way to end. <laughs> <laughs> with a memory of coexistence and and um and um i mean i just find i find this such an interesting i mean i feel you're creating a whole set of tools and a language to think about a very over overly determined kind of uh topic so that we can begin to think and imagine ourselves into it in in, in different ways that that um are helpful uh so i really really appreciate uh, uh this talk uh you delivered and also uh i think the book you're writing sounds like it's going to be a really um significant and an important one uh so thank you very much uh isabel 
I'm worried I spoke too much and that I didn't let anybody else ask questions. <laughs> there you go. I was I was provoked. So, so uh, thank you, everybody there in the real life world where you are. And <laughs> thanks to, the, to those of us who are virtual and um, and uh, and uh, good luck with the uh, rest of your research. Thank you. And thanks so much.